Hey everybody. Today I'd like to talk about Brexit. To be upfront and to let you know my biases before we get into the subject, I support Brexit. I support the UK's uh, decision to break ties with the EU. When I think about the EU, I conceptualize it in maybe three three pieces. It's useful for me. I don't know how useful it is for for other people. But the first piece is the free trade portion of it and the ability for people to move across national boundaries uh, freely without a passport. This is a really powerful economic situation. And I think overall, it carries the rest of the uh, European Union because I think the other two ways that I uh, conceptualize the EU kind of drag it down and make it unsustainable. But this is the, f the first portion is really good. And I think it's uh, a good policy for any nation, regardless if they are in the EU or not. The second part is the, I guess we could call it like the bureaucratic arm of the European Union. The part that uh, sets trade standards, imposes social legislation, and uh, other regulation that you would imagine would normally occur at the national level of a government. And this part seems a little superfluous because why can't each ind independent nation make their own rules and or negotiate with other countries to create standards for trade or legislation f that's appropriate to their country and their culture? The third part is... I guess we could call it the monetary policy. So the European Union has a central bank that backs its uh, currency, the euro, which is used in all European countries, as far as I know, besides the UK. And the problem here is that uh, central banks are imbued with a lot of power. And a lot of the problems that I'll describe here briefly apply to the United States with the Federal Reserve excuse me, the Federal Reserve. So central banks control the uh, monetary supply, the amount of money in the economy. They influence interest rates, and they can purchase government debt. All of those things can be abused, and I think the incentives are that they will be abu abused. So as far as the monetary supply, it's generally believed that a low level of inflation is healthy for an economy. But the problem with that is that over time, money is worth less, and so the incentive is for people to spend their money instead of save it. And this a lot of times puts people in, let's say, a compromising position because they would rather spend their money than to hold on to it, which is rational in a sense because why would you want to put money into a bank account that will be worth less in a couple of years uh, instead of purchasing goods with it and enjoying the full value of the money. Interest rates are a tricky thing because they, in a sense, they are the price of money. It, that affects everything from your bank account and how much interest you earn on your savings account in, the, in a given year, or it's the rate of interest that businesses get when they make loans or when they take loans for startups or whatever business purposes that they have and when interest rates are too low people don't uh, get rewarded for saving like in the u.s my savings accounts are awarded well less than one percent a year for their savings and so there's no real incentive to save and then on the other side of that businesses uh, decide to take loans on whether or not they believe that they'll be able to pay them back. And with a lower interest rate, it can give them the false impression that they can pay the loans back. Let's just say if it's easier to get loans, well, then more low quality uh, activity in industries will happen because money is easier to obtain. And so this can have negative consequences if a particular industry takes advantage of these loans to a larger degree than what the economy can sustain. This is a subject perhaps for another video.
But that's the long and short of it. So there's, in my conception, the EU represents three different parts. The free trade, which is amazing and great and should be the standard for every nation. You should be able to make trade agreements on the back of a bar napkin, in my opinion. The bureaucratic overhead, which is, let's say, redundant if we're dealing with a group of countries and the central bank, which can negatively manipulate uh, the entire economy as a whole because it has control of the money supply. I think it is a good idea for the EU to get out while they can because the EU is probably unsustainable. My layman's understanding of it, I don't think it's sustainable and eventually it'll probably end and best to get out while you can before the real bad stuff happens. For the UK, that means that now that they're pulling out of the EU, all they have to do is recreate the trade agreements that they have with them. And that would give them all of the benefits of being in the European Union without having to take the overhead and the monetary manipulation of the EU's central bank. Just a quick caveat. <clears throat> While doing research on the subject, because uh, you know, over the past couple of years, I've heard about Brexit and I've I've tracked it loosely, but now that it it's actually happening, I decided to read up on it a little bit more. Oh, uh, by the way, Brexit is officially occurring today, January 31st. I imagine anybody listening to this will be well past January 31st. But so this article right here, and I will link everything I talk about, every article that uh, I've referenced will be listed in the description. There's an interesting history with the UK and its approach to this European experiment. So after World War II, there was a push to unify the economies in Europe. Initially, it was called the European Economic Community. This is the precursor to the EU. And even then, there was a split and an argument inside of the UK whether or not to join. And what's interesting is that while today we associate conservatives or right-leaning uh, parties and individuals to be uh, skeptical of this organization and the left to be supportive, before they joined initially, it was reversed. The left or progressive individuals and politicians in the UK were skeptical of joining the, the uh, EEC because they didn't want to lose control of their country. They didn't want to give up part of their decision-making, whether it's labor laws and uh, other things like that, because they had their own agenda, similar to progressives nowadays. So they had their own visions for workplace standards and other social legislations that they wanted to enact and make sure that this new organization wouldn't thwart that. And the conservatives were pro-joining the EEC because they felt that either way, they were going to have to deal with this new organization and the rules that they set because they would have to end up trading with this, with all the countries that are inside of this organization. And their conception was, well, if there's going to be a body in charge of the economic landscape of of Europe better be to part of it better <clears throat> better to be part of it so that they can influence it so that they can make sure none of the policies are particularly negative to the UK's interests and the interesting thing is soon after they joined the part the different political spectrums realized or they flipped so the leftists figured out that oh, hey, the EEC and the people pushing it are leftists as well. And so the, all, many of their goals aligned, found ready allies in the European economic community. And the conservatives found out that the influence that they seek to gain was very little compared to the autonomy that they gave up. And so I would recommend reading this 
uh, this article just for some context behind the whole Brexit situation. Brexit, in essence, has been brewing the entire time that uh, the UK has been part of the EU. And we can see that in, I think, most most obviously in the fact that the UK still uses the pound instead of adopting the euro. And so there's a lot, there's a certain amount of, of autonomy that they've maintained. And as far as I've read, and I understand, they had a little bit more control over uh, their economic regulation and immigration, even though I think immigration is one of the, the issues that pushed many in the UK to favor leaving the EU. Okay, so here's our context. And I found an article about one of the last meetings, uh, European Parliament meetings, and a few of the British uh, MEPs made a few statements that I think encapsulize what I said about the European Union, about the economic unity being important, but the rest of it being overhead that uh, makes the partnership unpalatable. And so we'll start off with a statement by Daniel Hannon. And he said that in Britain, let me read, I'll read the whole thing. So prominent Eurosceptic Daniel Hannon had said opinion in Britain turned against the bloc when it became clear the aspiration was to have the EU as a quasi-state. So this is where the EU is pulling more power and authority into their own body and away from the member states. If at any stage Britain had been able to have a trade-only relationship, that would have been enough. He went on to add, You are losing a bad tenant and gaining a good neighbor. It's not about uh, sticking it to the EU and being obtuse, separating from the EU. It's more about having a voluntary relationship with it. Uh, also, Mr. Farage, I think that's how you say his name, had a good statement here. I want Brexit to start a debate right across Europe. What do we want from Europe? He said, arguing that trade, friendship, cooperation, and reciprocity between the nations could be achieved without all of these institutions and all of this power. And I feel that's a very reasonable thing to say. But the people that support Brexit, the opinions between them obviously is a wide range of beliefs. And you have your bad actors who are probably, to a certain extent, racist and want to be separate. But I think for the majority of people is they've seen that, democratically speaking, they've lost uh, a certain part of their rep representative government. I think one of the arguments that people make against the EU is that there are a bunch of unelected bureaucrats in Brussels. And I did some research about how exactly these bureaucrats gain their office. And it does appear that, by the by and large, it is a democratic process. I don't like democracy per se. I think in the long run, it encourages uh, special, inter special interest groups. And democracy, by and large, is, you know, the majority enforcing their opinion and preferences on the minority, or at least the law loud minority doing so on the majority. But a lot of people like democracy, and so we'll, we'll speak about it in those terms. So in the UK, they elect, and actually across the EU, the citizens elect representatives to the parliament. The parliament elects a parliament president. There's the other, another part of the EU is the European Council, which is 28 EU national leaders who had popularly elected national governments, and so on. So, in some cases, there is a separation, there's a, la a layer or two between the citizen and the politician that 
occupies an office, but by and large, it is it is kind of de- democratic. Democratic, and to say that it's they're undemocratically elected or uh, unelected officials is uh, it's false. But I think it's also true to say it would be untrue to say that um, the European Union is completely democratic. And I think this is by and large rooted in the idea, and I think most people would agree, that the EU is a collection of nations. And so typically in a nation, you have the citizens voting to elect politicians and to influence them to doing things and to represent the will of the people. Well, this starts to break down when policies that affect your nation directly are affected by voters in another country, let's say. Because the EU, while I think it is aspiring to be like the federal government in the United States, that's not how that's not how it is, as far as I understand it. And so for a bunch of people outside of your country to elect politicians to a, a position to make decisions that affect your country, even if you don't want those rules applied to you, does smack of being undemocratic and unrepresentative. And so I think it is unfair for people to also say that, you know, leavers or people who support Brexit are completely wrong when they say that it is unrepresentative, it's undemocratic, what's happening in the EU. So I said earlier that the UK's main hurdle will be recreating the trade agreements that they enjoyed and prospered from under the EU. And I think there is reason to believe that they will be able to. So it sounds like the leadership in the UK now are in a position to negotiate for a deal, a free trade deal with the EU that is similar to what they enjoy now. While today the the UK is no longer a part of the EU, they have a year to negotiate uh, trade deals and figure out all the particulars for how they're going to interact with Europe. And it's it looks like, according to this, this article here, that it, there's a real possibility that the UK does have enough leverage and standing to negotiate a good deal with Europe. And why not? Because uh, England has a decently sized economy. By leaving the EU, uh, the, they're not going to get the uh, whatever money and funding that the UK supplied to the EU while they were a, mem- a member. And one way to make up for that is to have a healthy trade relationship with them in lieu of being able to extract resources directly from them. And then also another big uh, positive, the UK is has been one of the US's biggest allies for a long time. And we're natural allies. And so why wouldn't the UK be able to make a really good trade deal with the US? Loosely speaking, you can say that the populist movement in the UK is what brought about Brexit and the populist movement in the United States is what brought about uh, Donald Trump. I am no Trump supporter. I didn't vote in the last elections. If he gets impeached, which uh, it looks like he he won't be, but it's no skin on my back. I, I have no sympathies with their ilk, but... The sort of conservative populism that you could identify in both places, I think, makes a trade deal even more likely between the two. And because the United States has a huge economy, it would be very beneficial. And if Britain can nail trade deals with the UK and the US, I don't see any reason why in the next few years they will see much more prosperity than they did under the EU, if not the same. There are a few positives for the UK leaving Europe 
And so I'll just quickly run through a few of them. For those that are on the internet a lot, I'm sure you've come across or heard about Article 13, where the European Union wants to make uh, tech companies who host the platform on the internet to be responsible for any copyrighted material that is posted on their platform. And so that's uh, obviously a huge burden on tech companies to be able to scrutinize a great deal of content accurately. And also it's a pretty blatant attack on free speech. It's kind of a, a subsidy or a a favor for corporations to police uh, their IP, even when people are using it to express a variety of ideas, to parody, to create their own unique uh, content out of all this stuff. And so now the EU or the UK will not have to implement this, this uh, opaque, difficult to enforce uh, law. And so I don't know how Article 13 will play out in the EU. Maybe it'll be more lax than I imagine. Maybe it'll it'll play out without uh, harming communication on the internet too much. Or maybe it will. But either way, they can judge a lot of this crazy stuff from the uh, European Union. Uh, apparently there's a struggle over who gets to use uh, UK fishing waters. Apparently, under the European Union, they had to allow other countries like France to fish from their waters. And so they get their sovereignty back, and I admit I do not know who is a better steward of the waters, but generally I prefer decentralizing authority and allowing uh, local organizations to be in control of the resources around them, so I, I see this as generally a, a positive thing. Uh, one last thing, they will get to control uh, immigration into the UK to a much much greater extent. I don't know the truth of what's going on precisely in in the UK, but it does sound like the level of immigration that they are experiencing has had a negative effect on crime, and a whole host of other things, and and maybe even placing an undue uh, pressure and burden on the NHS, their healthcare system. A country being able to determine how many people enter their country in a given year is better than uh, a super state deciding it. I would prefer that to be decided by uh, individuals on the ground and dispersing that power as much as possible, and people moving from one place to another on their own power or by whatever voluntary means they can do. But this is a move in the right direction as far as I'm concerned.